the European worldview and way of thinking, the way of looking at the universe. Human beings become separate and distinct individuals. The only way that you can know anything about the universe is to separate yourself from it, to take connectedness out of it, and thereby create what they call the object. That's all that you can know. Now, this, this object is a thing mm -hmm. that has uh, no, no, uh, no feeling, no meaning, no spirit. Okay? That's, a create, that's an illusion in their minds. But it works for them, because if they, what, what Plato did, if we can go back to Plato, okay. is that if he could get people to uh, agree that this was the only truth, then what he could do is say that, well, the people who were closest to that truth, those are the people who should rule all the other people. Mm -hmm. So that worked within their culture. It gave him the basis for a hierarchy within Europe. Now explain to me this creation of the object thing. I'm not, not clear on that. Okay, what you do is, um, if you can, as a human being, first separate, make a split in yourself and say, there's part of me that thinks and there's part of me that feels. Now, in reality, that doesn't happen. You're a whole person. At least that's the African conception. Uh -huh. But in his conception, that's what he said. That's what Plato said. Then what you say is, there's a part of me that's better than the other part of me. This thinking part is better than this other part, okay? Then you say that the better part needs to either control or do away with that lesser part. Mm -hmm. So you got this thinking being. This emotional part or what? The thinking part is getting rid of the emotional part. Right. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. Trying to control that. And so then what he says is, that's the only way that you can have knowledge. Okay? So here you, if you have somebody who is feeling, who is dealing with feelings, okay, um, or he, who is defined in that way, then they're the lesser person. They're the bad person. And they should be controlled by the person who is just doing this thought thing. Mm -hmm. You see? That they've constructed. All right? So within the state that he constructed, the republic, then he was able to say, uh, base it all on this concept of the object, to say that these better people who could, who could understand the object, who were not spiritually into things, mm -hmm. they were the people who should control things. Well, look what happens then when you get nations relating to each other or cultures relating to each other. You say, the culture that accepts this um, objective way of looking at truth. That's the creation of the object. That culture should dominate, control those that don't have that concept. They con should control the more spiritual cultures because they're the ones that are more civilized, more scientific, more rational, and all of mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to push you on this. This is a very okay. difficult... It this is. is a very difficult topic. Right. I'm going to push you because we want to make sure that, first of all, I understand, and secondly, <laughs> that everybody in the viewing audience okay. understand the creation of this object. object. Can I push okay. you? This object. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to get at that. Okay. Um, it's, it's always better for me to go back to our experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. For us, what I call... Uh, a phenomenal universe is important and to break that down all we mean is that experience is important the way we experience things is important in our knowing whatever that is mm -hmm. go back to the European conception the creation of the object you take out experience there should be no experience in there at all there should be no connection Okay? Another thing. For us, we learn through our involvement in the universe, in life. That, again, is experience. Go to the creation of the object. The way the object is created is by detaching the self from everything. The object is what? 
The object is the thing that is left when you detach yourself from the universe. All right. Say Remember, that again. Say that again. The object is what is left, and it's a thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> when you detach yourself from the universe. Okay. Think about Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. Meaning that there's nothing else that is important about a human being except this ability to somehow do this thing of rational thinking on this object. That's all that makes you a human being. That's what makes you important. For us, you can't separate thought and emotion. They're part of, they, their thought and feeling are necessarily linked and from that, we get intuitive knowledge, which is very important for Africans. What people. do the two do for each other? The emotional part and the, and the quote, rational. I think what they give is, they, they give us, uh, for one thing, intuitive understanding of things. Mm -hmm. That is, for African people, like the, the ancients used to say, know thyself. What they meant by that is, we are like a microcosm of the universe. The universe exists in us. That's an African belief, okay? Mm -hmm. Therefore, if that's true, then by studying yourself, by knowing yourself, you come to know the universe. By coming to know the universe, you're coming to know yourself. That's why they said, know thyself, okay? Mm -hmm. If we accept the European concept, then you're left with a self with no uh, relationship to the universe, no um, uh, emotional involvement in the universe. It is detached, okay? Um, but that was necessary to create that object. The important thing about the object was that it could be controlled. That's what Plato was getting at, and that's what has been accepted since his time. That in order to know, in order to be able to have knowledge, you had to be independent. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what the separateness did for you. Mm -hmm. And that's what the lack of feeling did for you. It gave you control over something. What you control is the object. So we come back to the object. Now, if you look in terms of people and cultures, we become the object. Okay. You see, okay. that can be controlled, that can be acted on in any way necessary or possible. What do you do when you go into a scientific laboratory? You have these things that you can manipulate and do whatever you want with. That's the same way in which African people are treated, are related to by Europeans as objects that can be manipulated in whatever way has to be manipulated. Now, what we do is we feed into that by accepting their definitions of reality. Or we would understand, we're not objects, hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? That there is a spiritual reality that connects us to the universe and so forth and so on. You, you've already touched on this, but um, um, what do you mean by spiritual, spiritual universe? And what kind of universe did um, okay. Plato... We'll be talking about him a lot, I see. Oh, uh, uh, boy. <laughs> By a spiritual uh, universe. We, n we mean um, a u universe that is fundamentally spiritual in nature. That means that spirit is the fundamental reality. That, that means that there is a level of reality that gives meaning to everything else in the universe that that's the, it's, it's like a foundation. It gives meaning to everything else and it connects everything else. See, that's why rhythm, by the way, is so important to us as a people because it's that which connects things. We believe in connectedness. We look for relationships, for interrelationships. Again, what Plato did was, the, what I believe is that that connectedness, that rhythm, in the universe is difficult for the European to understand because they function on a level of um, surface, a surface level, a literal level, not a multi-dimensional level with depth. And when you start talking about spirit, you're talking about uh, multi-dimensionality, multi-levels that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. When you talk about the object, what you're doing is that's just a very surface um, kind of reality. 
In all African systems, there are levels that you go to as you grow. In fact, life, uh, a human life, is the development through stages of existence where you, you're learning more and more and more, mm -hmm. you know, about yourself and the universe. So among the Dogon people, if I can go back to them, they have a level, the, the simplest level is called Jiri So. G-I-R-I, -I, then S-O, and it uh, translates um, word at face value. For them, that is the most superficial level of learning. Mm -hmm. And they move from there to um, what they call word from the side, then word from behind, then clear word. So you're getting to deeper, uh, you're, getting, you're gaining perspective, you see, you, you're, you're getting textures of, of, of truth. Mm -hmm. You go to the object, you go to Plato's concept, and what you have is a very simplistic way of looking at reality that necessarily disconnects everything. It compartmentalizes. It separates. Go back to your question about what is the spiritual universe. The spiritual universe, that concept tells us that you cannot separate things that there is some level on which everything is interconnected, okay? That's one thing it means. It also means that um, we are focused on meaning, not just what something appears to be, but what does it mean? How is it a, a, a symbol of a, of a deeper sacred truth? That's what it means to think in terms of a spiritual universe. That's how we think as, as African beings. So it's powerful. But it's also um, difficult mm -hmm. if, if, you, if it's not your nature. Mm -hmm. And maybe impossible if it's not your nature. You see? Mm -hmm. So if, if um, what, what Plato was doing, and we really need to get beyond this because it's, 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 it's larger than, than Plato. Okay. okay? Uh, but what he was doing was he came along at a time in European development where... Um, in order to solidify and to concretize and to, and to further develop the definition of what it meant to be European, he used um, thought. He said, if I can get people to agree to a certain way of, of thinking, mm -hmm. um, then it can help to uh, uh, define who's going to be in charge of this hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if you're dealing with a people who, remember what, what um, uh, the, the Africans said about the Greeks. What did they say? They said, you Greeks are but children. What did they mean? They meant that they could only um, approach reality on a, on, that, on a surface level, that they couldn't understand the depth of the symbolism that was involved in African culture mm -hmm. and in comedic uh, civilization. So now, if he could get people to accept a definition of truth, which was simple in this way, you see, which did cut out the spirit, the rhythm, the connectedness, and so forth, then what he could do was to indeed infer, affirm who he was. Mm. That's what they did. They defined truth in such a way that it, um, that it affirmed them it was indeed in their Image. Now you say that his work was not very influential um, during the time that he lived. Uh, how did it become so influential? Okay, when, it, when I say that it wasn't um, very influential, I mean that he was still fighting a, a battle. Mm -hmm. That there were still other views. Okay. And it was not uh, popular, mm -hmm. you know, at that time. But he had vision. That's what I believe. That he was definitely not a... Uh, a philosopher with his head in the clouds, uh, as Aristophanes said about the making, poking fun at the philosophers of the time, that he had a model, had a plan, and had a vision. So that what happens is you, uh, the academy he puts in place, the academy becomes the institution which supports this concept of truth, which in turn supports the structure of the state that he's trying to build. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which includes slavery and everything else. Um, after him, then you get um, these conceptions being developed by later uh, subsequent philosophers. Um, 
even Aristotle, who is, um, you know, when you learn in school, he is uh, contrasted with Plato, like, like his one big difference between Aristotle and Plato. From our point of view, in terms of cultural realities, in terms of the European Asili, they're like extensions of each other. Mm -hmm. He's just a continuance of that and, and, and put focus in a, in a different area, further developed it, but has the same Asili. Then you come to the Neoplatonists. You come to uh, even Augustine. I'm showing how Augustine's uh, 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 relationship to Platonic thought. And then you have, once you have the academy in, in place, and people should understand what I mean by the academy, that is where um, uh, your scholars, you know, come out of. That is the basis for all of the educational system that we have and, and so forth. Um, once that's in play, it begins to grow and grow and grow and s to the point that what we have now is you don't have to argue for a particular concept of truth in the school, say here in America. Mm -hmm. It is assumed the thing that Plato was arguing for then. He had to argue, for instance, for the uh, dominance of the written or, or, or literate modality over the all. What had been the uh, tradition was uh, uh, the reciting of, of uh, um, oral um, uh, epics and, 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 and stories and so forth that everybody could get involved in. And there was a lot of emotional involvement and so forth. Um, what Plato saw in that was he couldn't control that. It was a lack of control. There's too much participation, mm -hmm. you see, from large numbers of people. But in terms of how they used writing, it becomes a mechanism for control. It's lineal in thinking, non-circular. The, 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 the lineal is less spiritual, you see? Mm -hmm. it's, it's more secular, and it becomes something where once you write down the, the word, then that word becomes oppressive. Oh, what do you mean, then? Writing. What do you mean, then? It's like, uh, you know, we do that now. Um, we'll say, oh, um, it's in a book. I had a teacher once said to me that um, as missionaries went into Africa and other areas, Catholic missionaries, that they didn't have a problem converting us because they had a superior religion, and the way that people knew that it was superior was because there was this book. Mm -hmm. That it was, it was in writing, and it was something that they could point to in writing. So that what, what Plato was setting up was that you could use uh, the written word to intimidate people and have them feel that something was truer because mm -hmm. it was in writing word to intimidate people and have them feel that something was truer because mm -hmm. it was in writing okay now um, that wasn't always the case because at the time we're talking that he's writing and doing his work you know how many people are reading <laughs> mm -hmm. not many and that took a long time until the, the Gutenberg galaxy where you had uh, many, many more books um, available of uh, the Gutenberg Bible, that it was made, it, the printing was such that uh, there could be, uh, you know, books, and uh, it, primarily it was the Bible, available to people on a large scale, media people, okay? Writing is very important. I'm not going to tell you it yeah. isn't. Books are very important. They're also very limited. You see? That that is only one way of if, if um, I write something, then um, I shouldn't be relying just on a literate uh, or literal, literal interpretation of what it is I'm saying. Mm -hmm. If I do that, that's very closed. When we you write poetry mm -hmm. when we um, compose music okay when we drum all the things that we do 
it allows for much more than a literal interpretation so that we're able to get to a deeper level of reality. And all I'm saying is that we should not, um, we should not close out these other modes mm -hmm. of expression, um, of, of communication, that they're very important. What we're doing now is very important. It can't, we cannot rely merely on the written word. Okay, and I think that there is a tendency for us not to understand that, for us to, um, to not understand the power that is in other modalities of ways in which we uh, express ourselves. And even in the way that we use the written word, because our people did that. We used writing, but we used it in a more symbolic way. Okay. Okay. What is the Europeanization of human consciousness? It is the acceptance of what I'm calling the objectification of the universe, mm -hmm. the materialization of the universe, so that again, um, spirit is denied, spirit is uh, mistrusted, um, it is relegated to an inferior uh, uh, position. And what happens is then, we um, think in ways that facilitate our oppression. We think in ways that deny our spiritual power. That's what I call the Europeanization of, of our consciousness. And that has been talked about by other authors. Um, Asante talks about that. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it is a consciousness which reflects the European. Mm -hmm. Someone sitting home might say, well, you know, what's, what's the harm in listening to a little Bach, a little Beethoven, um, getting into some Mil Milton, almost said Mil mm -hmm. <laughs> Mil Milton, what's the, what's the harm? The harm is that if you are a people who have uh, been so conditioned as we have, mm -hmm. that we have to even sit here and discuss, convince each other of what are our strengths, um, what did we lose, what did we have, who are we, in a positive sense that your focus tends to become that little bit of Bach and that little bit of Milton and a and little bit of this, so forth and so on, when you have not indeed understood the African worldview, African philosophy, African conceptions of truth, what African ritual is all about, um, ancient African history, um, African culture, that you have not, that needs to be your frame of reference. Then, when you get that little bit of Bach, you have a context within which to place it. What happens with us is the reverse. We have terms, and this comes out of the European uh, Asili, the European concept of truth, like classical okay classical is supposed to mean the highest form in any particular culture right it's what you value most that's one meaning for classical it also can be a reference point a pinnacle a high point so we are raised to think that Bach Beethoven whoever that represents classical music in a universal sense that becomes our reference point we're saying well that's the best everything else and now we know we don't enjoy it the most you know what i mean <laughs> we know that but we feel a little bit uh well that helps to make us not quite we haven't reached yet 
You know what I mean? Whatever that point is we're supposed to reach, we haven't gotten there yet because we still enjoy all this other music. we got to be refined a little bit more. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the danger. The danger is what we know of the culture of our uh, 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 oppressors and the place that it has in our value system that is this superficial value system which is a product of colonialism it's mm -hmm. being colonized that's the danger the danger is that we right now the, the 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 position that we're in the condition that we're in we need to be putting all of our energies into understanding who we are because by understanding that that's what gives you the, 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 the posture to be able to look critically at what has been imposed on us. We don't have a place to look critically at it because we are assuming the superiority of it. Mm -hmm. That's why I thought this study was important because all you have to do is get outside of it, study the African worldview, and then you can be in a position to deny that reality. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question to, to, to finish up with Plato. You would say that Plato uh, played a great role in creating what we today call the European? Yes. And for what reason now? Yes. Um, what I see is that um, in the development of um, European culture, which is an ongoing process, um, in the fulfillment of the Asili, that there are certain seminal points, seminal thinkers, doers, um, who at whatever point in history they were at, um, served a, 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 a role of, um, of solidifying and further developing the definition of what it means to be European. Now, be let's look at before Plato. What you have are a lot of European groups. You know, we can look at the Indo-Europeans who have already, the Asili Sea, I think, is in place. Okay? How does it manifest itself? It manifests itself in aggression. aggression. A silly meaning this cultural seed uh -huh. that for the Europeans is defined in terms of the need for power in order to um, um, uh, uh, achieve fulfillment. Okay, I believe that's unlike any other cultural theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so you see aggression. You already see the individualism. It would be good to look at Diaz's work, for instance, in terms of looking at the features of what he calls the, you know, the Indo-European or the Northern Cradle. Okay, mm -hmm. so you, you already see these things. However, it cannot become the, the world dominant power that it needs to be because you, they're not uh, unified. Okay, so what do you need? You need something to begin to say to these people, you are one. You um, can gain more power by coming together. Because when you've got this strong destructive tendency, which is something that I talk about, you know, in the book, mm -hmm. you see, there's an innate destructive tendency. You've got this individualism because we've already talked about the separation of, of, of the human being, right? Mm -hmm. You've got this aggressive tendency then if you, something doesn't bring you together, what will you do? You destroy each other, okay? Plato comes along and he uses the concept of truth, what, what would be called an epistemology. That's only the concept of truth. Uses that um, as something around which people can come together and identify and say, okay, this is going to be us. Now, as I said, that didn't happen right away. He had to fight all these other people that would be dissonant, you know, voices. But eventually, yes, that became what Europeans identified with. They said this way of thinking, this rationalism, this extreme rationalism that helps us to control, it gives us the illusion that we are controlling the future, the past, the universe, and everything. Mm -hmm. This is us as European people. So he was key at that point. Now, then you get a little later stage, here comes along 
Let's look at 312. Um, what they call A.D. Um, here comes Constantine. What does he do? He sees that with statements which will uh, help to achieve this world domination, mm -hmm. this power, help to bring these Europeans together so that they can have power over others. So he adopts Christianity. You see? Mm -hmm. And that gives him the model that he needs in order to say, we have the right, in fact, we have the mandate. And he said he personally had the mandate, and you need to look at his own quotes and the things that were written about him, to go throughout the world and in the name of this one true God, which was them, which was the Europeans, um, to make everybody into uh, these Christians. So he's adopting Christianity as a weapon of control. Absolutely. And as to, to uh, it, it's compatible with the Roman Empire. The, on a political level, you've got this empire which is spreading and spreading and spreading, right? He wants control of that. He looks at this religion and he says, ha, huh, that'll do it. That will help me. What I'll do is say, look, there's only one God. Christianity comes along. There are all these other religions in the world. Christianity comes along and says, all of the other religions are false. All of them are bad. This is the one true one. Well, that fits. Then he says, I've been placed here to uh, service this one true God. They put me here for this. I've got to conquer people so that they can, you know, be correct religiously. I hate to do it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> All right. But I have to. <laughs> Go ahead. What you going to do? No, go ahead. No, I'm just saying. That's All right. what he's saying. <laughs> so that's what he's saying. Um, yeah. You know, he, he had this vision, this dream with this cross, and the cross said, conquer by this. Now, this is all in his own words and in his friend's, Eusebius' words, right? And he takes this cross, made everybody make these crosses, and said, conquer by this, and they went into battle. They won, and that was it. He said, yeah, this is the thing. And I'm saying that at that point in the development of uh, uh, European culture, that was key. That became this solidifying, uh, uh, defining form, uh, institution that would help to bring together. Uh, the monolithic. Yes. Uh -huh. What was what was Europe? What was it going to be? All fulfilling the Asili. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then at another stage, um, you get this definition of science doing that. Again, based on this, this concept of the object, mm -hmm. that um, we are the scientists. This is the age of science. Um, uh, we are in the forefront of that. Uh, and therefore, we have the right to rule the world, really, because we are the scientists. We are the smartest people, most knowledgeable people. Um, the uh, capitalism at, at, at one point becomes uh, that which brings together uh, the European self-image um, and has them working as one, helping to further develop the Asili. So at different stages in European development, um, there, there is a need, there's, there's this, this tendency to, to be fighting each other, you see, um, um, and then, of course, you have all the other people in the world who are also uh, developing and responding to this, so you need ways of, of controlling them and ways of, of making sure your troops are tight mm -hmm. and together. So you need something to rally around. I want to ask you about Greek myth and, and how Greek myth help explain um, European violence. Oh, um... Well, I think it, 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 it uh, probably helps more to um, not so much explain it, but as to, to, to demonstrate mm -hmm. it and the need for violence, which I think is part of the Asili. Mm -hmm. um, there is, um, well, let's not even look at, let, let's not look at, at uh, myth. Let's look at, um, let's go prior to that and look at, uh, Indo-European um, 
mythology. When you uh, talk about Odin mm -hmm. uh, and these various gods who were the war gods, who had to be fed uh, by human blood, um, who rewarded people with um, uh, uh, this heaven, uh, you know, Valhalla, yeah, Valhalla. Um, which was the warrior heaven, which was this great honor if you got to go there. Um, and the emphasis was on uh, individual, uh, individuals in battle, and, uh, you know, the bloodier the battle, the, the better it was, because it, it made you a, a, a better person, and, and so forth. Um, early Indo-European mythology um, is, is replete with, or filled with, um, these kinds of, of images and, and, uh, and concepts. Um, within the Greek culture, we get the same thing, where um, violence is um, it's valued. Um, it's sought after. There is some kind of fulfillment that comes out of it. Now, in terms of my uh, analysis, um, it is that the Asili, again, you must understand, is incomplete. So that it's not in harmony with the universe. And I think the concept of harmony is a very important one for us as a spiritual people. Um, and so it, it is like almost uh, what uh, Colby Cambone says, um, uh, formerly uh, uh, Joe Baldwin. He says that, that they come to be, the European, as being outside of, of nature, outside of that natural uh, uh, universe which is a state of harmony. And therefore, there's this constant thrust to try to um, uh, 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 subdue nature or to see that as an enemy so that the emphasis is on confrontation, it's on destruction, um, and you see it within Greek culture, uh, you know, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that the Yassili, um, um has to, it, it forces the, 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 the collective the group uh, 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 behavior to be destructive. Now that can bring us to even their concept of progress. We as African people accept this idea of progress, thinking that uh, we've got to imitate uh, Europeans, that, um, you know, uh, everything that is technologically more efficient is better. The higher uh, you can build buildings, the better it is. The more cement that you have, you know, the bigger the cities and so forth and so on. We don't really look at where their idea of progress comes from. It comes from their worldview. And it is really about um, controlling nature. It is about, and, and, and the feelings of power that come from that for them. So we don't get feelings of power by controlling nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's the difference. Um, it is about consuming the universe. Consumption. So that now you get them talking about the problem of, uh, what, ecological sanity, they call it. Mm -hmm. That's a very deep issue. But they are not prepared to deal with it because the culture doesn't have the, the wherewithal to deal with it. You can't deal with uh, the concept of uh, interrelationship of all of us as natural beings in the universe and the balance and harmony when you're talking about things being objects. Mm -hmm. You can't do that because the way you think doesn't allow you to do mm -hmm. it. What problem does that present for African people? Um, you talked about how Plato influenced um, the European thinking, but here you have uh, Africans um, in African Americans in mm -hmm. this case, mm -hmm. in a culture where, as you indicated earlier, we are forced in many cases to ape, mm -hmm. ape European. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how does how does this need to split mm -hmm. the emotional mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the uh, rational mm -hmm. 
all right, to be like Plato. Right. How does that impact on us? Okay. What it does is that um, if we were, we talk about having independent schools, which I think is what we need to be doing. We need to be having our own schools because, of course, you've got to educate your own children. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing that, we need to be looking at what are the concepts that you're going to use as you develop your children. How are you going to make sure that they are being developed as African children? How are you going to guarantee that it is a spiritual conception of the universe that they learn to use so that they can be, that their energies can be, can be liberated, can be released. What is happening is that we are using these same concepts that you've just referred to in dealing with our own children. What does that do to them? You know how we talk all the time about uh, the problem of our children being turned off in school? You have teachers talking about, I can't reach them. We talk about, um, oh, this child is hyperactive, um, and so you want to give them drugs so that you can, you know, uh, control them. Mm -hmm. um, what we're doing is trying to relate to our children using our, uh, using alien concepts of not only truth, not only learning, but of the human being. So that the spiritual needs of our children are not being met in those school arenas. Because we've made the mistake of thinking that, see what a, the academy means is that you separate out whatever is intellectual from everything else. So that in the European conception, an academy is, is a place where intellectual things go on and there's no place for anything else. That's not a realistic uh, conception of a human being. Human being is a whole human being. So when you have a child in a school and in a classroom, they are not just this mind that you, that you want to control. Pump stuff in. <laughs> that you yeah. pump stuff yeah. in and yeah. you're ignoring the rest of them and so forth. So that we have to find, for instance, I'm going to take something which will seem very simple to you, uh -huh. um, probably unimportant. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> but, it's, but to uh -huh. me, it's central. Mm -hmm. And it's a good example. If we, we are going to have to look at how do we build buildings. Mm -hmm. How do we build buildings in such a way that we help ourselves to, to communicate with each other and with our spirits. Mm -hmm. And how will that help us to think? How are we going to arrange classroom? We take for granted that you have to arrange a classroom so that you have these lines of seats. You know, and then we ask the children to stick. They come in there. You know, we talk about five, six, seven-year-olds and they have to sit. And they have to sit absolutely still all the time. There's, there's no other way that they do things. Suppose when we come together, we form circles. You see? Mm -hmm. Would that make a difference? That's what we have to begin to look at. Is we have to question everything, which is enlightenment, which is spiritual fulfillment, illumination. This comes straight out of um, African civilization. Um, all African learning involves that, okay? So that this was a group of people who took the, the, um, the Christian mythology and used the mode of the mysteries. And they would come together in groups and, and talk and try to develop themselves spiritually and so forth. Now, there were problems with that. Because given a spiritual conception of the universe, which they had, mm -hmm. okay? They said that the importance of the myth about Jesus 
was that it pointed to the ability of all human beings to be reborn spiritually and that it was a symbol of that rebirth that was an important point another important uh, point about their organization was um, they didn't believe in hierarchy they would come together in groups it's almost like you have a study group now mm -hmm. and you learn from each other no bosses exactly mm -hmm. okay so that was an important uh, point another point we could make is that uh, the female principal or women had a, 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 a more important part to play mm -hmm. in uh, in their group okay now but institutionalized religion had an ideological role to play okay a political role to play in the formulation and the solidification of the European Empire, okay, in order to fulfill the Asili, which is seeking power. Constantine sees this. Others see this. What would help that to happen is to have an institution, the church, which has a hierarchy, um, which has a chain of command, Okay, that's one thing. So keep that in mind. So the Gnostics are a threat to that because they say, no, we don't recognize any hierarchy. Very importantly. Now this is a, this is a, this fascinates me, this point, but, but you just got to follow me along, okay? Uh -huh. okay? We're we'll following you on this one. All right. Go ahead. <laughs> there is what we call the Apostolic Church. The Apostles. Uh -huh. What they say, and this is a, what most Christians would say is that the resurrection of Jesus was an actual I don't think actual is a good word here physical occurrence an historical occurrence now question is why do they put so much emphasis on that okay the Gnostics said that that whole concept was to be understood symbolically, again, as pointing to the idea of how you could resurrect the spirit. And so it was a spiritual concept, okay? Now, we know that we had had concepts of resurrection long before the Jesus story, mm -hmm. right? So that the, the meaning of that has to do with uh, the regeneration of life, okay? and with illumination and coming to know self and so forth. It's a very deep concept. The Apostolic uh, Christian Church said that it had only to be understood as an historical, physical occurrence that took place just like you and I are sitting here. The resurrection. Yes, that it did not, it was not to be understood spiritually or symbolically. Why? Why did they put so much emphasis on that? Because then what they said was, this took place at a, at a particular point in time, particular place, and there were people who saw it. Why are they so important? Because those people can then say, well, Jesus said to me, do this, build this, okay? Mm -hmm. Upon this rock and so forth. And those people who actually witnessed this, this physical occurrence, then pass on authority, which they have gotten directly from by, this person. By being in the presence. By being in that presence. Mm -hmm. They pass it on. Then that group passes it on. That is the concept of the apostolic church. What are you passing on? You're passing on authority. You're passing on the sanction to be able to say, we control this and we can tell you what is right and what is wrong and so forth and what to do and how it should work. So that papal authority to this day in the Catholic Church, in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. is based on that foundation of being able to say that 
this is something that occurred at a specific time in a specific place and there were these people who saw it and they then had the authority to then give us the authority. So you see how organization is involved, ideology is involved, and that it had to serve a particular uh, purpose of political achieving, purpose. a uh -huh. political purpose of achieving mm -hmm. power. The Gnostics would get in the way of that. And there were other heretics, they called them heretics also, who were giving different interpretations of the teachings that didn't fit mm -hmm. the objective of gaining power. The Gnostics were saying, no, that's not the important thing. Everybody can experience uh, this rebirth and this, re this resurrection. And everybody can become spiritually illuminated. But it takes work, and it takes spiritual work. Now to the Judeo-Christian split, which is um, okay. just as interesting. Yeah, I enjoy talking about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the background that... that, that, that uh, that I'm assuming that people would know, because uh -huh. I just I don't have time to go okay. through all of that, is the extent to which Judaism embodied the, the um, values and principles that we're talking about they are part of European culture. Okay, very, very, uh, the, the monotheism, the, um, uh, the written codification, okay? Um, also patriarchy, by the way, but that's another issue. Uh -huh. um, so then you have the Christian formulation, which comes directly out of that, right? So then the question, I, I remember I was young and always raised in my mind, well, why then this antagonism? Why the need to say, you know, that one was wrong and one was right and we're not them and so forth, when they're really, you know, the same thing? The answer is always political and in terms of power when you're talking about European culture. And that's what the concept of Hasili helps us to mm -hmm. do. Always look for what are the political implications? What are the implications for the development of European culture? Look at the power trail. Exactly. Uh -huh. And that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's mm -hmm. a trail. Mm -hmm. um, what Judaism did was to say to its people, which was a small group of people, you are a special people. You have been put here to, um, to be a model. And through your actions, others will, they will learn and they will see that. But still, they're not going to be you. They aren't going to be the chosen people. They aren't going to be the special people ever. You have been put here for that special reason. Okay? Um... What Paul begins to do is something else. That statement, that the, the statement that the Jewish people are making within that religious context is not one that can be used for expansion. They aren't seeking converts. You see? Mm -hmm. They're saying, we're special. And we're, we're, we're an elite, whatever we are, and we're content to remain that way. We know we're superior. We don't want to convert anybody. We don't want to convert anybody uh -huh. because you can't be us. Mm -hmm. But the European, how should I put it, ego, self-image is expanding. It's got to grow because they're talking about world domination. They want to conquer people. How can they use the religion to conquer people and at the same time say you can't be in this? They couldn't do that. So what changes is the whole definition of the Gentiles and that they could also be saved. So that Paul can then preach, people can then preach, if you come into this thing, we can then save you. Well then now, so what do you gain by that? You gain the same way that the Romans were able to go around the world and say, look, we'll make you a Roman citizen. And then by that, you become civilized. And still, they maintain power. Okay? This uses the religion to say, become a Christian. You will be saved. But it's like being saved in their image. Mm -hmm. Because still, it's Europeans in control. Europeans in dominance. The Jewish statement was too um, contained 
okay, to tribalistic in a sense, to allow for that. Um, and it's a question of rhetoric as well. What has worked so well in European Christianity to colonize uh, all of us is the rhetoric of saying, we love you and we have this gift to share with you and we're doing this for you. You know, the whole brotherhood mm -hmm. rhetoric. That is only rhetoric that is meant for those who uh, would be victims of the colonial thrust, of the imperialistic thrust. Okay, that rhetoric was not in the Jewish statement. It didn't say. In fact, you need to look at Deuteronomy. You need to look at the Old Testament. It's very clear. It's saying you do whatever you have to do to those other people who believe in those other gods. Kill them. Their children, the babies. Now, this is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what extent people you know, have carefully read mm -hmm. that. But look in Deuteronomy. It is very clear. It's a very uh, uh, aggressive uh, uh, statement in the sense of, it's really defensive, saying protect yourself against those false gods and kill anybody that you have to mm -hmm. who is trying to get you to believe in any other god. Mm -hmm. Okay? But it did not, it's not about them trying to go throughout the world and convert um, other people. 